time for Tim McCoy. In looking over this cowboy gear, a lot of people are apt to ask, does the cowboy just wear that stuff for effect or is it useful? Well, of course, through the years, they may have fancied up a lot of their equipment, but every article that a cowboy has in his possession, everything he wears, everything he uses, is mighty important in the life of a cowboy. Now take the saddle, for instance. The saddle, of course, as the old Texas Rangers used to say, the saddle's our home and the sky is our roof. Well, that's what a cowboy works in. There's his workbench. And you see that horn on the saddle? Whenever he's roped a critter or a horse, he can take his dallies around that horn and that acts as a snubbing post. And it has to be strong because just think of the weight that's thrown on that saddle sometimes with a thousand pound steer on the end of a rope. So it has to be big and strong and stout, you see. Of course, some cowboys think that this thing was put on for another purpose. You've heard of grabbing leather? When a fellow's on a bucking horse, very often he'll reach down and get a hold of that thing to steady himself. But you know, Every time I've ever been bucked off a horse, I never could find it. I always kept reaching for it, and I generally pick up a handful of sagebrush. <laughs> I've known fellows that said, it's no sin to pull leather. If you get on a tough horse, reach down and get a hold of that thing. That's what the good Lord put it there for. <laughs> now these stirrups. These don't look much like the stirrups you see on a flat saddle, the kind that's used in parks, and English hunting, and that sort of thing. But a cowboy has to have a great big open stirrup because half the time in mounting a bronc, he isn't going to get time to fish around and set that on his foot. He's got the spirit on the fly, so he wants something as big and heavy that'll be right there so his foot will go right in it. Now, as far as those stirrups are concerned, there's a bit of equipment that goes over them. Here. We call them taps. Most of the expressions you have in cowboy lore are Spanish, Mexican, because the cattle industry came up out of Mexico, came up into Texas and the border states, and then moved on up north. So with it came a language that came out of the south. And these were called tapaderos. Now this protection for the feet, those taps fit right over the stirrup. And down in that southern country where they have a lot of brush, chaparral, cactus, they're a great protection because they keep cactus spines and thorns from running into a man's feet. I can remember one time when we used to wear them up north, too. Not so much for brush, because we weren't in such a brushy country, but we wore them in the wintertime, and we lined them with heavy, heavy sheepskin, just to keep our feet warm. So there's a reason for those things. Cowboy expression is taps, chaps, and latigo straps. Now, chaps, is nothing but an abbreviation of the word chaparreros. Now this chaparrero comes from the, what the Spanish used to call armas. It meant armor or protection. And then they came to these armetas, which were very short, and then the chaparrera, which a man would wear in the brush, and those leather chaps, you see, protect a man going through rough brush and keep him from getting all skinned up. Now these ornaments, these conchos down the side, Yes, they're ornamental, but they have a purpose also. They hold the rings, you see, that snap the inside of those bat-wing shafts. Now, some shafts are made without those, and the legs are sewn right up solidly. That's why I call them stovepipe legs. So you put your foot right in them like you would a, a stovepipe. Now, we've got a number of shafts around here somewhere. Oh, here's a type that we used to use up in our country that might interest you. You don't see them down south. But they all wore them up north. And that's the Angoras. Now in the winter time, or even in the cold rains, in the spring and in the fall, 
A leather chap will just turn water about so long, and then around your knees, the water will soak in. But with these Angoras, it took an awful lot of snow or rain to get through and get your leg wet. They were the nicest things in the wintertime, particularly because they kept you very warm riding. And they use them up north now. They're still used all through those northern states of Wyoming, Montana, the Dakotas, Idaho, over the border into Canada. So when you see those Angoras on a man, he isn't wearing them just to be fancy. He's trying to keep warm in cold weather. And these ropes, well, the cowboy's rope, lariat, riet as we call it, or a throw rope as a lot of them call it. Youngsters call it a lasso. Well, this is a grass rope. It's manila hemp. Now those ropes are fine except when they get wet. They're tougher than a rawhide rope. They'll stand more strain, but in wet weather, a braided rawhide like this one, water has very little effect on it. They're all full of grease and oil anyway, and they're one of the finest ropes made. Most of the southern fellows will use those. They didn't use them up north very much because we had bigger, heavier cattle up there, and the cowboys would tie their ropes hard and fast on the saddle horn so that when they roped a critter, he could go to the end of it. But with these, if he went to the end of a small rawhide like that, he'd break it. So they take their dallies around the saddle horn and then let him run to the end of it. And you just see the smoke coming off that saddle horn and they slowed him down gradually. So there's a little difference in the equipment that we use up north and the equipment that's used in the south. Well, then there's our boots, for instance. You wonder about a cowboy's boot. Yes, they've gotten pretty fancy through the years but they've always been fairly fancy. Now here's a pair that I had made not long ago. And the reason this design is on there, it's because of my years of association with the Indians. And I've had my bootmaker dress this up with war bonnets. Now when you get to that high heel, people say, why do they wear that high heel? Well, it's very useful. In the first place, you saw that big open stirrup back there. If that were a flat heel, your foot could go clear through that stirrup. You might be thrown or a horse fall with you. Your foot would hang up in there and you'd be dragged to death. But that high heel keeps your foot from going through that big open stirrup and there's a great protection. Then sometimes when you're on the ground and you've roped a horse in a corral, you can rear back and dig in those heels and you're just like a snubbing post. You don't slip along the top of the ground, you see? So there's a reason for the high heel. The fanciness, well, that's the cowboy's idea. We dress them up in different ways. Now, on the boot, you'll find the cowboy's spurs. Now, there's an old pair of spurs that I used on the range for many years. They're not very fancy, but they're just a good work-a-day spur. But the ones that I've worn mostly from the time I came into pictures and in all my activities are these. Now, you hear how they ring? That's because there's good steel, of course, in the bands and in the shank. And then the rowels are made of silver steel. And when you step off a horse, they make a mighty pretty sound. <laughs> As I said before, most of our stuff came up from Mexico. And here is a pair of spurs. Listen to those. That's what we call the cowboys up here, call those chihuahuas, because of the Mexican state of Chihuahua. But they don't have such a long shank. They all go in for a great big rowel. Now, those are all silver mounted. Listen to the ring on those. Here's a pair that came up from the Argentine. Now, this is going in pretty fancy because the concho on the side of these is made to resemble a sombrero. And then, of course, the rowels are encased in silver and there's gold inlay all around them. One thing about these spurs you must remember, a cowboy never has sharp prongs on those rowels. No matter how big they are, the rowel is always dulled so that he doesn't cut a horse with them. All he wants to do is remind a horse to go ahead. Because if he's got his reins in one hand and the coils of his rope and a loop in the other, he's got both hands occupied, so the only thing he can do to indicate to his horse that he wants him to go ahead is use those spurs. But he doesn't want to hurt the horse he just wants to remind him. So just remember that when you think it might be cruel. 
Oh, there's so many things about this cowboy gear here. Look at this muffler. Now, that's a big muffler. Not one of the little strings that you'll see tied around someone's neck in a moving picture, maybe. But this is the type that they used to wear on the range in my day. It had a lot of uses, you know. If you're trailing behind a bunch of cattle, the dust is rolling up on you, you pull your muffler up over your nose and wear it that way. Then even sometimes, in the wintertime, when you were cold, you could put it over your head, pull your hat on top of it and tie it under your chin, and it kept your ears warm, you pulled your coat over the back of it and the wind didn't go down your neck. And there's nothing warmer on the ears than silk. So there were a dozen uses for that muffler, but it was always worn big and loose around the neck. It's practically passed out these days. And your cowboy hats, they don't wear the big ones anymore. But we used to. Now, there are some of my prize hats that I had made a long time ago. John B. Stetson. Some of the best of them. And this one, I always call the granddaddy of them all. Now, these hats are made out of the finest quality beaver. They protect you from the hot western sun. And on rainy days, they act as an umbrella. They hold their shape. Nothing interferes with them. And you've always got protection, as I say, from sun and rain. That's why we like the big hats. When I say they don't wear them that big, well, they were only a few of us wore them that big in the old days. Now, if taken all together, the general effect, well, you find it pretty picturesque. Well, it's not exactly the cowboy's fault. But as I say, when they're taken all together and then they're analyzed, each and every one of these things I've told you about now are pretty important in the life of the cowboy. Join us for another authentic story of the West when we again meet America's favorite Western storyteller, Tim McCoy. <laughs> <laughs> 